Hello everyone and welcome back to the revisionary classes on long term financing decisions. This is the third part of this revision class. Over here we are talking about determining cost of capital and we will be focusing on the determination of cost of debt. Let me remind you in the previous session we have talked about one thing that determining cost of capital will encompass two stages. Stage one where you determine the cost of capital for each individual source of capital that is debt, preference share, equity share and retained earnings. So determining cost of capital for each individual source is the first stage and then the second stage will be to determine the overall cost of capital which will be the weighted average of cost of capital of these individual components. So the first component over here is debt and uh, cost of debt will be the first stage of our discussion. Now the computation of cost of debt depends upon the type of debt. Debt can be of two types, irredeemable debt which is also known as perpetual debt and second is the redeemable debt. So the term irredeemable debt many students have a wrong perception with this term. The term irredeemable some students believe that this is a debt which will never be redeemed it is not like that. A debt which will be redeemable only upon the liquidation of the company that is irredeemable or perpetual debt. However, when it is a redeemable debt, redeemable debt will be a debt which will be redeemable at a defined point of time and that will be certain number of years from the date of issue. Now, if the debt is irredeemable debt or a perpetual debt, the manner of determining the cost of debt is different and when it is a redeemable debt the manner of determining the cost of capital is different. Now over here because these are revisionary videos I am just giving you the concepts and the detailed concepts will be available in the concept videos link for which I have given to you in the description below this video. So let us uh, quickly write up some important notes over here. Determining cost of capital particularly the cost of debt symbolized as a KD. Cost of debt will depend upon the type of debt. Debt can be classified into two types. One is irredeemable debt and another is redeemable debt. So let us first talk about irredeemable debt and uh, this is also known as perpetual debt. Irredeemable debt is such a debt which is redeemed only upon liquidation of the company. It is also known as perpetual debt. Cost of irredeemable debt. It is determined by this formula. KD equals to interest into 1 minus T divided by NP where T stands for tax rate and NP stands for net proceeds. I told you if you are willing to find logical understanding behind this formula please watch the concept videos link for which has been given in the description already. Now moving ahead when it is the another category of debt that is cost of redeemable debt Cost of redeemable debt can be determined by two different approaches. One is the approximation method which itself has two different versions and another is the YTM approach which we call as yield to maturity. Let us understand each of these one by one. Approximation method will be having this particular formula application and interest into 1 minus T plus RV minus NP upon N whole upon RV plus NP divided by 2. Let me quickly explain you this part of the formula. What happens when you are calculating cost of debt, interest is the major component of the cost. So this interest will be having the benefit of tax. So 1 minus tax rate is applied on the amount of interest to convert the amount of interest as a post tax interest. So this becomes the first category of your cost of debt, first segment of the cost of debt. The second segment is difference between RV and NP divided by N. Let me explain you this part as well. Suppose redeemable value is 12 lakhs and net proceeds on issue of debt is 10 lakhs. Then 12 lakhs minus 10 lakhs is the excess amount that you are making as a repayment. Even that is cost. But that 2 lakhs is not a cost of any one year. It is to be divided by the number of years of debt that is the life of debt. That means in that case suppose the life of that debt is 5 years then 2 lakhs will be divided by 5 years and the average cost per year will be added to this interest component. Then the denominator over here is average of the redeemable value and net proceeds. 
So, in my example, where net proceeds it is 10 lakhs and redeemable value is 12 lakhs, 12 lakhs plus 10 lakhs divided by 2, the average will be 11 lakhs and the average of redeemable value and net proceeds will become the denominator over here. So, just define the variables RV stands for redeemable value, NP stands for net proceeds, N is the life of debt and T stands for tax rate. Now, this is approximation method. We have yet another version of this approximation method. Let me explain that as well. The better version actually. So, here what you do is you do not compute the post tax interest. The interest amount is taken as it is. That is why when you are computing KD, it is basically pre-tax KD. So, you take the gross amount of interest which is pre-tax and then add up this component divided by the average of redeemable value and net proceeds and then you separately compute post tax cost of debt and that will be pre tax cost of debt into 1 minus tax rate and you can just define the variables RV is redeemable value, NP is net proceeds, N stands for the life of the debt and T is for tax rate. This is actually a better version of the approximation method. Both of these versions are given in your study material. You can apply any one in examination. But in today's scenario, the most effective approach is this one which we call as yield to maturity approach. The yield to maturity indicates IRR of the debt. Such YTM or IRR will be considered as a pre-tax cost of debt. Later on, one can determine post-tax cost of debt by multiplying 1 minus T to YTM. Now friends, when it comes to this particular segment, I am emphasizing on one thing very importantly that is uh, this calculation of yield to maturity. This calculation of cost of debt using this YTM approach, it is very very important. It is basically indicating the IRR of the debt. So, the IRR for the investor that is internal rate of return for the investor is basically the yield to maturity for the investor and from the company's viewpoint the investors yield to maturity is the cost of debt that is the fundamental concept over here. The computation part has been explained in the concept videos and the link for the same has been given in the description below this particular video. So, you may please refer question number 17 and 18 from regular class videos for developing complete understanding about these concepts. Let us move ahead to the next component that is cost of preference shares. Now, cost of preference share is computed just like cost of debt. So, here also you may use two approaches, the approximation approach or the YTM approach. However, when you are using the approximation approach, understand one thing that 1 minus tax rate adjustment is not required because when you are computing KP that is cost of preference share, the component is not interest, the component of cost is preference dividend and the component of preference dividend in your income statement always arises after tax. Means this entire calculation is already a post tax calculation. Therefore, 1 minus tax rate need not be applied to this calculation. Please refer question number 19 from regular class videos for developing complete understanding about this concept. Alright friends, so let us move ahead and now talk about the next component of cost of capital that is cost of equity. Now this is something very very different from what you have learned earlier in the form of cost of debt and cost of preference share. Why a difference? Because here in case of equity, what you give to equity is not your cost. The understanding goes this way that equity shareholders are the real owners of the company and now whatever they expect from the company as their rate of return, it becomes company's responsibility to provide those returns to the owners of the company, correct? And therefore, we can conclude in one line that whatever is expected as rate of return by the equity shareholder, that rate will become the cost of equity for the company. Now, here Different categories of equity shareholders can have different types of expectations. So, for example, some shareholders would have acquired the shares in the company only and only to earn dividends. On the other side, there may be some shareholders who would have acquired shares in the company not only to receive dividend, but also to get involved in the benefit of growth. Because when the company's share price will rise ahead, 
they will be selling the shares at a high price and earn that capital appreciation that means they are aspiring for growth as well as dividends yet another category of shareholder could be a larger company which has purchased majority shares in this company and that company has become a shareholder that company is not interested in what is the dividend and growth of this particular company that company is more interested in the business of this company it is more interested in the earnings of this company so can you understand one thing cost of equity for the company is nothing but the expected rate of return by the shareholder and the expected rate of return by the shareholder could be on different grounds and that is why we have different approaches for determining cost of equity so we have typically five different approaches one that we call as dividend price approach one that we call as dividend price plus growth approach one that we call as earnings price approach one that we call as realized yield approach and the last one is capital asset pricing model so what i'll do is i'll give you quick notes on the same and a quick revision on the same however for detailed discussion on the same concepts i have given those concept video links please watch those videos if you find a necessity so let us move ahead over here and under the heading cost of equity you may write determining cost of equity is little complicated this is because equity shareholders are the owners of the company and the company does not have a definite outflow towards equity which can be used for determining cost of equity therefore whatever is the expected rate of return by the equity shareholders will be considered as cost of equity for the company the complication arises because equity shareholders may have different expectations some shareholders expect dividend and growth whereas some shareholders focus on maximizing the eps moving ahead we say that is why there are five different approaches for determining ke that is dividend price approach then it is dividend price plus growth approach then it is earnings price approach realized yield approach and capital asset pricing model now let us move ahead and discuss each one of these approaches one by one so dividend price plus growth approach k equals to d1 by p0 plus g now let us define these variables k stands for cost of equity d1 stands for expected dividend receivable by year end p0 stands for price of equity share prevailing in the market at present and g is nothing but the growth rate let us move ahead and now talk about dividend price approach here k equals to d1 by p0 and under earnings price approach k equals to e1 by p0 now over here a new variable that we find is e1 which is uh, indication of expected eps by year end now please uh, take an important note as well the most frequently used approach and therefore the most preferred approach is dividend price plus growth approach let us move ahead and now what we do is we talk about the fundamental ground of determining ke now you should know one thing p0 equals to d1 plus p1 upon 1 plus ke now fundamentally what happens whenever there is any kind of future expected cash flow that future expected cash flow when it is divided by 1 plus expected rate of return you will eventually get the present value of that cash flow so understand one thing assume that you have invested into equity share for one year period after one year you will be getting the dividend on that equity share and you will be getting the price of that equity share by end of the year so d1 and p1 will be your future cash flows now your future cash flows when they are divided by 1 plus expected rate of return that will give you the present value of that cash flow now here the expected rate of return for the shareholder is ke so ke is representing the expected rate of return so when you divide the future cash flow by 1 plus expected rate of return what you eventually get is the present value of those future cash flows which is symbolized as p0 over here now what is appearing in front of you is a base share valuation formula there is p0 equals to d1 plus p1 upon 1 plus ke entire chapter of corporate dividend decisions is based on this model so when you talk about p0 equals to d1 plus p1 upon 1 plus ke the same can become the base for determining the cost of equity let me explain you how it will happen so p0 equals to d1 plus p1 upon 1 plus ke 
upon cross multiplication you will be getting 1 plus ke equals to d1 plus p1 upon p0 and through this if you want to determine the value of ke it will be d1 plus p1 upon p0 minus 1. Now if you want to include that minus 1 within the brackets with the fraction where the denominator is p0 to give the effect of minus 1 the numerator also has to be minus p0. So the modified version of this equation will be ke equals to d1 plus p1 minus p0 whole upon p0. Now we can further split this into ke equals to d1 by p0 plus p1 minus p0 divided by p0. Now you should know one thing that in the formula the variable g stands for growth rate and growth rate is nothing but the difference in the price that is p1 minus p0 divided by p0. So the value of p1 minus p0 divided by p0 that is over here if you substitute for g what you get is ke equals to d1 by p0 plus g. Now that becomes your formula for cost of equity as per dividend price plus growth approach. Alright now let us move ahead and understand something more about this formula. When you write ke equals to d1 by p0 plus g the component of d1 by p0 is identified as dividend yield rate and g stands for the growth rate. So basically the expected rate of return by the equity shareholder is the aggregate of these two components that is dividend yield rate and growth rate. So once you have understood this moving ahead when you rewrite ke equals to d1 by p0 plus g when you take g to the other side what you will get is d1 by p0 as ke minus g and through this if you want to arrive at the value of p0 just cross multiply and you get d1 by ke minus g as the value of p0 this is basically the share valuation formula developed by Gordon. So refer question number 20, 21 and question number 33 from regular class for developing complete understanding about these concepts.